Good morning, and thank you for joining us. I'm Josh Freed, Senior Vice President for the Climate and Energy Program at Third Way. And along with our co-hosts, Blue Green Alliance and the Environmental Defense Fund, I'm excited to welcome you to today's conversation on the 48C Advanced Energy Manufacturing Tax Credit and the role it can play in creating good jobs and economic growth, reducing emissions, and ensuring that our clean energy future is American made. In case anyone needs a refresher, in the onset of the Great Recession back in 2009 and 2010, the country was in need of major policy interventions to stabilize the economy and get Americans back to work. It might not be the most well-known piece of the Recovery Act, but the 48C program was a highly effective one. 48C offered a 30% tax credit for investment for companies to build and retool facilities that produce clean energy technologies, from solar to wind to electric vehicles and their power systems, as well as carbon capture and smart grid technologies. Manufacturers competed for the limited amount of total credits available and demand was high. The program was oversubscribed by about three to one. All told, nearly 200 applicants in 43 states received the tax credit. According to estimates from the Obama White House, the $2.3 billion uh, in 48C tax credits made available by Congress was projected to create 58,000 direct and indirect jobs and unlock $5.4 billion in private sector investment in US manufacturing. Now, as America faces a pandemic-induced downturn that cuts deeper than the Great Recession. We'll need policy tools that can accelerate our recovery and make the US more competitive and resilient in the future. We know 48C can do that. In fact, Third Way is preparing to release a new analysis from Industrial Economics Inc. that shows for every $1 billion issued under a revived 48C tax credit program, it could add $3.6 billion in GDP and create nearly 8,000 direct jobs. 48C also can help us address other pressing challenges that threaten the well being and livelihoods of American communities climate change. Many states and cities and companies across the country made strides to promote clean energy and emissions reductions despite the obstructions of the Trump administration. But the US has a lot of catching up to do. 48C can help reduce the cost and accelerate the deployment of a huge range of clean energy products that we will need to get our emissions back on track. Given its ability to advance several of the nation's most urgent priorities and Leaders on the Hill, excuse me, uh, leaders on the Hill and many of us in the advocacy community are turning our attention once again to 48C. And that's exactly what brings us here today. We're gonna dive deep into this topic with an impressive panel of industry, labor and environmental advocacy leaders. But first, I am honored to introduce a special guest, Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia. As ranking member, and hopefully in the new year, chair of the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee, Senator Manchin has sought to advance energy policy that considers both environmental and economic needs. He is committing to finding common ground between the parties in order to make progress on challenging issues. Throughout this Congress, Senator Manchin has worked tirelessly with committee chairman Lisa Murkowski of Alaska on an energy innovation package that would be a critical down payment on a net zero emissions future. This package authorizes investment in important research, development, demonstration, and deployment activities across the clean energy portfolio. With any luck, that will get over the finish line within hopefully the very next few days, which would be a big win for US competitiveness and a major step forward, not all of it, but a major step forward on climate change. He has also been working with Senator Dabby Stabenow of Michigan on legislation that would revive and update 48C, which you'll get to hear about from him directly. We're excited to have Senator Manchin here. 
and I'm looking forward to his conversation with my friend and co-host, Jason Walsh, Executive Director of the Blue Green Alliance. And I'll hand it over now to Jason to hear this conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Josh. Uh, as Josh said, uh, I'm the executive director of the Blue Green Alliance. We are a coalition that unites millions of members and supporters from the labor and environmental movements to build a clean, fair, and thriving economy. I'm excited to be here with Senator Manchin to talk about how manufacturing can secure and create millions of high skill, high wage jobs and provide pathways into the middle class for workers and families, all while helping us achieve significant reductions in emissions. This year, the Blue-Green Alliance put forward a manufacturing agenda that represents a blueprint for how the US can lead in clean technology manufacturing and reinvest in our industrial base to make it the cleanest and most advanced in the world. And to do so, while rebuilding good American jobs in a way that is clean, safe, and fair for workers and communities alike. We can't afford to fall behind the rest of the world in building the technologies of the future. And it's essential that working people and communities see the gains from innovation and a clean economy. The time to act is now. We need real leadership from Congress and the president. And I am very pleased to be speaking with one such congressional leader, Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia, who has been fighting to both secure the manufacturing jobs we have and spur the growth of new manufacturing jobs in his state and across our country. Senator, thank you for joining us. Good to be with you, Jason. Let me uh, move right into questions. And sure. let me also remind uh, viewers that you can submit uh, questions. We'll have a, a time to, to ask the Senator a couple of them a, a, a after a few minutes here. Uh, and you can do that through the Q&A function in Zoom. Uh, but let me turn to you, Senator. Um, why do you see action on 48C as a priority now? Well, as Josh had mentioned earlier, 48C was so, so absolutely uh, uh, instrumental in, in creating so many jobs with an, uh, an investment of what, 2 billion back then. This is an $8 billion investment we're talking about now. Debbie Stabenow is my partner. Uh, and what we've done is broke this up and it's basically all manufacturer, but directing to where we've had job losses the automobile industry has taken you know, a hit in Michigan and many other places around the country. The coal industry has taken a hit. And basically as we evolve and change, whether it's the electric cars or the clean environment, we're evolving in a way that we don't wanna leave anybody behind, Jason. So if you're not gonna leave people behind, if you wanna know why our country is so divided, it's divided because of the policies that we have not been able to enable and look at how we bring people along with us. So this $4 billion will be directed to coal industry, coal lost, jobs lost, coal mines closing, uh, uh, utility companies, there were coal fired uh, utility plants that have closed. How do we keep those communities and those people still in the mix, if you will, and the economic opportunities that we should provide? So this is what we're looking for and this 48C tax credit. And I've always said this, you show, you know, as, as we transition from fossil, as we continue to transition and find more new technologies and using our, uh, our renewables in a way that are much more competitive than what they were at first and become more cost effective. And as we have battery storage and all the things that will be happening, who knows, we'll have fusion, hydrogen, a lot of things we can look forward to. If there's a new energy coming, we know that. And as we do, you can't forget the people that provided the energy that made the country what we are today. So I've said this, follow the money, just follow the money. The tax credits, if you're gonna be using tax credits to create new uh, types of technologies or to bring them into more of a matured state, that's great. That's how we've got your renewables where they are today. But what happened, we forgot about the people and the jobs that were lost and left behind. And I've told people, the people, the, the, the good hardworking coal miners in West Virginia feel like the returning Vietnam veteran. 
we've done everything you've asked. We've done the tough jobs, the dirty jobs, and we fought and we sacrificed. And now there's no respect or appreciation. 48C, what we're doing here, Jason, does that. It returns the respect that we should be giving the people, but also giving them new opportunities with it. So if you're going to have a new industry and we're going to be banking, uh, we've said this, we can innovate our way to a cleaner climate. If you're looking at it globally, we should be the manufacturers of the technology that uses all forms of energy in the cleanest fashion possible with reducing our emissions. And it should be done in the areas that have lost the jobs that basically made the country that we are, give them a chance to now take us to the clean future. That's all we're doing. It's common sense. I've said this, you give a coal miner a chance to build you a windmill or a solar panel, you'll have the damn best windmill you've ever seen. Efficient, done well with pride and, craft, and craftsmanship. And the same on any other uh, type of technology that we want as we traverse this chasm. And if we don't do that, you want to know why there's such a divide between the urban and the rural? That's why. They think they've been forgotten and left behind. This does takes that and in, to another to a whole nother realm. And I'm excited. Debbie's excited. Republicans are excited because we all know Democrats and Republicans have to work together, Jason. We can't continue the past decade. We made all the mistakes we did. You know, that's the form of insanity if we continue to do it. That yep. is a definition of insanity yeah. to do what we've done in the past. So that's where we are. That's why we're excited. Eight billion dollars for for the uh, for the uh, fossil and industry coal uh, to re re reinvent themselves if you can, and for in the auto industry with all the new batteries and vehicles and electrics that's coming on board. Yeah, uh, we're excited too, Senator. And and uh, I, I think it's important to note that President-elect Biden uh, talks about uh, our obligation. To the workers and communities that have powered this country. Yeah. And I think the, the, your legislation fits squarely within that, right? Um, let's talk a little bit about supply chain vulnerabilities. We um, have seen during the current COVID crisis how our inability to manufacture basic PPE in the U.S. put Americans, particularly frontline workers, in danger. Can you talk a little bit about why developing domestic manufacturing supply chains matters in emerging energy sectors and how this bill addresses them? You know, I, I want all of our friends on both on all sides of the aisle, uh, from the, from the uh, blue collar uh, to the uh, to our uh, environmental friends, everybody to understand. Our main goal is to remain energy independent, and that doesn't mean throwing caution to the wind, Jason. But you you must keep that goal. Energy independence is makes us the country we are with the superpower of the world. If we had to depend on other energy sources to run this economy of ours and to keep us fueled and fired up and ready to roll, then we're in trouble. I'll give you a perfect example, rare earth, rare earth minerals. We don't produce hardly any of them. And we know that we can recycle out of the coal waste that we've had. An awful lot of rare earth minerals are in those waste ponds, if you will, and the waste can be recycled. It's better for the environment, gives us the products that we need in, in a domestic market. So a lot of those things we're looking at a little differently than we did before. Also, you know, we just passed a bill. We're going to pass the omnibus bill here. The omnibus, omnibus bill, so you'll have an idea, Jason, it's the Energy Act of 2020 is placed in that omnibus bill. We haven't done an Energy Act for 12 to 13 years. 12 to, we didn't have the, the iPhone wasn't even invented back then. So think of where we are behind the, behind the, the scales, if you will. $35 billion dollars is going to be authorized to advance energy efficiencies, energy storage, renewables, nuclear, carbon capture, utilization and storage, direct air capture, industrial emission, reducing technologies, grid modernization, and, uh, and all types of DOE reforms. This is a tremendous piece of legislation. If people have been following it, 90% of it is in the omnibus bill. So that's a tremendous step forward. So we're going to be able to hit the ground running. We're just, uh, we need all, we need partners here. If we can all look at each other as partners, you know, in a partnership and partnership, I, I want you to succeed as much as I want to succeed. Yeah. I can't get the upper hand or you can't get the upper hand or get a slighted hand because then it's not a partnership. Yeah. And if we can take these, these challenges, we can clean up it, but you got to remember, 
I keep telling people, it's a global climate, Jason. It's not a West Virginia climate. It's not a United States climate or a North American climate. It's global. How do we get India? Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna go back into the Paris Accord, right? And we should, but we should make China have the same. They're a developed nation now. They're, I mean, they're not is emerging. They are an industrial developed nation. They should not have a 20 year hiatus for, oh, we gotta give you a little exceptions there. It's time for all of us, let's sign up. I wanna sign up. We're gonna hit our marks in 2030 and 2050, if not before. Thank you, Senator. Uh, we, we are, uh, of course, in the middle of both the public health and, and, and economic crisis. Can you say a little bit more about the role um, that rebuilding American manufacturing plays as we think about and work toward economic recovery? Let's talk about this. You mentioned PPE. For the life of me, I cannot understand why the president didn't in March when we knew we had this pandemic in us, basically declared the Defense Production Act. He had the ability as one person. He didn't even need us to sign off. He has that authority and didn't do it. Now we have manufacturing. I just, Mylan Pharmaceutical in Morgantown, West Virginia, 1,500 people are losing their job. They're shutting that manufacturing plant down. Pfizer bought them, okay? They're the new Viatris company now, but Pfizer bought them and they merged with Upjohn and Mylan merged to be called Viatris. We're closing one of the biggest manufacturers of pharmaceuticals. They can make anything there. We shouldn't let that happen. And this has happened before. How do we run short on PPEs? You know, they used warp speed on, on the vaccine, which I think it was great. We could have had warp speed on everything to protect people better. And that wasn't done and it still hasn't been done. So I can't explain it, but I can hope for a new beginning with Joe Biden as our president coming in now and really directing our efforts to how do we grow an economy the cleanest fashion possible, but also be practical enough to be able to, hey, India, you want a caveat to our, to our markets? Then use the technology we've developed. You can't use first generation technology when we're on third and fourth generation technology just because you're emerging. But if you want access to the markets, this is what you need to do. So that's the only thing I know how to work with a sovereign country is to give them a little bit of a caveat there. And like I said before, follow the money. Yeah. Let me, let me uh, move to, to some of the questions from the audience. Sure. Um, uh, are the jobs that are going to be brought by this bill to uh, coal economy workers and other hard hit areas, do they, do they include high tech jobs? Oh my goodness. Yeah, that's exactly because the, the, the stereotype well, a coal miner or basically just a factory worker it, it does not capable of doing these high tech. They all have to be computer wizards today. Yeah. You almost have to be a computer wizard to use a telephone. Yeah. And, and if you've ever been to manufacturing, modern manufacturing, they're all touchstone screen. They're all touch screens. They're all doing things. They're programming. Hell, they're, they're writing code. They're almost doing everything yeah. to make things work. So, yes, it's all high tech and it will be high tech and we can train for that. That is not that hard to do. People that want a job, want to make a living and want to live in the area they've been living for a couple, two, three generations, they will adapt. Trust me, they're hungry for it. They're hungry for it. And we have no problem at all. So a person thinking, i got to move my manufacturing down here to, AC, uh, to tap into that $4 billion for uh, the fossil industry and, and those areas where coal was produced or coal plant was, uh, was producing uh, electricity or whatever, thinking that I might not have the workforce there. No worries there at all. I know the people too well. And I'm the same for the auto industry. You know, in the 50s, when the, when the continuous miner came in and the coal companies, and that was like 59 and 60, we lost thousands and thousands of coal mining jobs. They all migrated up to the auto industry up in Ohio and up in Michigan when they left West Virginia at that time. So these people all have the abilities and the skills to do whatever you ask them to do. Give them a chance, show a basic training program, show them and I'll guarantee you they'll pick it up and go with it. Remember, these are people that have had to survive in very dangerous work. Their life depends on it. They can adapt. Yeah. In, in, in our remaining couple of minutes here, Senator, could sure. you just talk a little bit about the political path forward for this legislation? You, you talked about building bipartisan support for it. 
say a little bit more about how you see this 48C legislation moving forward? And well, the, the two billion dollars, all you have to do basically, uh, Hans, you know, uh, this is not we're not uh, this is not a new pair of eyes. We're not reinventing the wheel here, Jason. Look and see what good you saw. What Josh was talking about from Third Way, basically what it's done already. The two, how much demand there was for it for the 48C when it was first came out with two billion. Multiply that by eight billion now. Multiply that fourfold over, and let's look at the numbers. This is something we can hand to Joe Biden day one. Basically, we're going to move it immediately with a new Congress coming in, but it's a win-win for everybody. Because we're going to be looking, I think, uh, under the Biden administration, I think he's going to be looking very practical uh, of uh, doing infrastructure. That's a win-win. I've always said this. Do something that brings everybody together. This country has been torn apart, split apart, and they've been tribalism. Now there's times for the tribes to join as one tribe, the United States of America tribe. Because we've been a divided country. We need to be a united country again. The best way to do that is pick something everybody agrees on. I said, listen. Jobs, everybody agrees on. Democrat, Republican like jobs. Infrastructure. The pothole doesn't have a Democrat or Republican name on it. It'll bust your tire and your car the same as it will mine. So what brings us together? Fixing things that we all need and not taking on things that divides us more. That's where I think the common sense of Joe Biden will, will be. Amen, Senator. Uh, we look forward to advancing this important legislation. Uh, we need your help on this, Jason. We need everybody, all your, your, your whole group from every spectrum at all, because this is a good piece of legislation. It allows a person who's always made their living in the fossil industry, seeing with the new emerging technologies, clean technologies, all the things that we can do to clean up the environment, that there's a good living to be made. They never thought before they'd ever have an opportunity. So that's why they've hung on and clung so tight to what they've had. And now they're understanding things are changing, markets are changing. And, and we're going to change also, but we're going to do it in a way that everyone has an opportunity. And that's what this is all about. Those are great remarks to close us out on. Senator, thank you for joining us. Thank you for being a champ on thank these issues. Well, Jason, uh, thank all of you all. You guys are on the front row. You're out there on the front line every day, and we appreciate it more than you know. It's not going unnoticed, but we need you all to come. When you all can come together from the industrial, I always said the economy and the environment should go hand in hand. There's a balance to be had. You can't divide them. Don't let them divide us anymore. We can have a good economy and a clean environment. And we work to make that happen. Couldn't Thank have said you. it better myself, Senator. Uh, on, that, on that note, I will pass the mic back to my colleague, Ryan Fitzgerald from Third Way. Hold on. Hi, thank you, Jason, and um, thank you, Senator Manchin, for uh, for joining us. We know there's a lot going on right now, um, and it means a lot. It shows your dedication to this issue and the bill that you've been working on with Senator Stabenow. So we appreciate you being here to talk about it a bit. Um, as Jason said, I'm Ryan Fitzpatrick, and I am the director of the Climate and Energy Program at Third Way. Uh, I'm really excited to be guiding this conversation with our panel of policy experts. Um, if you have any questions for the panelists that pop up during the conversation you should drop them into the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen, similar to what you were able to do with uh, Senator Manchin's conversation. Um, and you can get those submitted into the queue. We're gonna save some time at the end of the conversation to make sure we can get to a few of, the, few of those questions. Um, but let's go ahead and, uh, and meet our panelists. So we'll start off uh, with Roxanne Brown, who serves as International Vice President at Large for the United States Workers. Uh, the workers have over a million members in North America. Um, and despite the name, uh, they have a presence in many, many industries, um, including across manufacturing. Uh, next up, we've got Lori Holmes. Lori is the Senior Director for Environmental Policy at NEMA, the Motor and Equipment Manufacturers Association. Their members supply parts um, for the motor vehicles industries. Uh, we have Derek Walker. Uh, Derek is Vice President for US Climate at Environmental Defense Fund, which is one of the most influential environmental organizations in the country or worldwide for that matter. And uh, rounding up the panel uh, is JT Young, who is the Director of Government Relations at Ford Motor Company. So thank you everybody for joining. We really appreciate you being here. Uh, I'd like to start with JT. 
um, since Ford actually received a 48C tax credit several years ago. Um, so we're lucky enough that we can get an insider's view here. JC, can you tell us about how the company put 48C to use and some of the impacts that it had? Uh, you're on mute, JT. My apologies. Um, I'd be happy to talk to you about the 48C credit and want to echo uh, everything that Senator Manchin said in our introduction of how important the 48C credit is. We received a 48C credit in uh, 2013. It allowed us to transform a facility we have in Wayne, Michigan into the world's first and most flexible electric vehicle manufacturing facility in the world at the time. Um, and it allowed us to make on one assembly line the multiplicity of electrification options that we see as necessary to uh, reaching consumers in the market. I think again, what Senator Manchin was saying about the multiplicity of energy options that 48C allows, we see the same thing in the auto industry. So it allowed us to build hybrid electric vehicles uh, plug in electric vehicles uh, and to use existing technology that we already had to put into those vehicles as well. So um, as you can imagine, one assembly line being able to uh, run several different uh, hybrid electric, plug in electric and battery electric vehicles on the same assembly line is just so crucial, uh, especially as we're trying to, to get an increased take up in these vehicles because sadly electrification still amounts to only about 3% of the vehicles that are sold currently. So they're basically still small production and you need a multiplicity of production uh, of the, to make a, multipl a multiplicity of vehicles to reach these consumers and to popularize these different kinds of technologies. And the 30, uh, the 48C credit allowed us to do that. And what did that mean in terms of adding, you talked about some of the added capacity or the range of products that you were able to, to um, put through. What did that do in terms of your ability to create jobs or you know, new opportunities in that particular community? Well, um, uh, to your point, um, and for one, I, I think, and Senator Manchin again was talking about this in, the, in regards to coal mining. Um, it's, it's important to uh, obviously create new jobs. We made an announcement earlier this year where uh, we are going to be making an electrified commercial van and that was, uh, would put uh, jobs in. But it's also the jobs that we save because you've got to, uh, uh, as Senator Manchin was uh, pointing out, you know, as we move from one type to the other, uh, this allows us to keep people working uh, as we move from one type of vehicle to another. So uh, Ford uh, between, uh, bef through 2022, we'll be uh, investing about $11.5 billion in electrification. And so that will create a lot of new jobs but it's also the jobs that we save as well as we move from one from an internal combustion engine to the electrification. So this is maybe a very hypothetical here, but in a hypothetical world in which let's say the 48C tax credit is revived and maybe modified. Um, and let's say that Ford wanted to apply for something like this again and received and this application was approved. Um, how would that, how could that impact the goals and the strategy that Ford has already started laying out to move more into electric vehicles? What additional impact could that have and decisions about timing and location of your manufacturing operations and the assembly? Um, to your point, uh we see the world is very competitive right now uh, for electrification. I think you're seeing this uh, on a global reach right now that everybody sees their auto industry as one of their top tier manufacturing. These are jobs that they want to have and, and we can all use 
our memories and think of, uh, you just throw out a country and you can associate a vehicle with them. So there's a large global com competition and governments are offering these incentives. So the 48C only makes domestic investment that much more attractive and to your point as well. Uh, you prioritize, what are you going to electrify? You know, how can we move from this product to another product and what models are we going to electrify? The 48C by adding new resources that were not there before allows you to go down that list to push into more uh, cutting edge products, um, more products instead of saying, um, well, we're going to do our top five vehicles. Maybe you're going to do your top six now, or you move down, or you can take a risk. You can take a chance because uh, again, as the 48 C uh, credit does, it does not limit you to one type. Uh, there are fuel cells that qualify. Um, and we don't know what, what's going to be the type of vehicle or the type of electrification that's really going to catch a consumer. And in, in different types of what they use the vehicle for, maybe it's a battery electric that's what they need. Maybe it's a plug-in that's what they need. So you just don't know. But the key is the more electrification we can do and the better off we're going to be, the more advances we're going to make. And the 48C allows us to do that. That's great. Well, so Laurie, I, that leads me to a question for you. You know, your association, you represent manufacturers that feed into the supply chain for automakers like Ford. Why is 48C important to companies that, um, that make the components that go into these clean energy technologies? Sure. So just a little bit of a background that Mima likes to talk about is that motor vehicle suppliers make up 77% of the value of a new vehicle. And so a lot of that, those components include emissions control technologies and electrification technologies and the fuel efficiency technologies. And a lot of those technologies, um, suppliers really lead the way in developing these innovative emissions control technologies and the clean technologies. And a lot of this development is extremely risky for suppliers because suppliers really work independently to try to anticipate what their customers are going to need and what the um, emission standards are going to require in say two years in five years and 10 years. So a lot of those that guessing and then innovation and the development is very resource intensive. And so of course that leads to very risky um, investments because they don't know exactly what they're going to need and what their customers are going to need or what the market is going to need. So Anything like the 48C, um, there's other um, programs like Department of Energy's Vehicle Technologies Research and Development and the federal loans for such as advanced technology for vehicle manufacturing, and of course, the 48C tax credit, it just mitigates a little bit of that risk for motor vehicle suppliers when they're making those decisions on those advanced technologies. Um, you know, the other you know, it, so again, it, it helps mitigate the risks the suppliers are taking on to decide on which of those investments to make. It helps with the internal prioritization of those investments. Um, and, you know, in the long term, I think it could probably even help with um, consumers making those technologies a little bit more affordable. Um, <clears throat> and it brings to the, uh, it helps make those innovative technologies um, and brings it to the, com the commercial market a little bit faster. So I think those are the you know, advantages of the 48C4 suppliers. It's again, just providing a little bit more certainty for suppliers and mitigating that risk just a little bit more. Right, yeah, so we've heard about, you know, maybe accelerating the, the, the pace or the path that some of these um, companies, maybe, maybe the, the larger, the automakers themselves are on helping them accelerate that, providing them the tools that will enable them to meet their goals faster, helping move the, you know, the transition for components along more rapidly. But a great point that you just made, maybe the ability to actually reduce the cost of some of the, the components and ultimately finished products um, that customers are demanding. Um, so that I think is a really important point. You know, and, and the, the suppliers that you all represent, um, they range in size. You know, some of these are very large companies, but also, you know, some some are not quite so big. Would you see a variety, a company, a companies from a variety of sizes being able to take advantage of something like 48C? Yes, absolutely. 
point, the suppliers do range quite a bit in this size. And I think any sort of um, you know, electrification component or even just the fuel efficiency advanced technologies, um, I think a lot of companies will be able to take advantage of that because of the wide range of um, technologies that the 48C could, um, could qualify for. Uh, I think that's also a great point and a good segue of just saying that the um, the other element of why 48C is so important and it could be very beneficial is that it just will help keep the supply chain for electrification and these advanced emission control technologies in the U.S. I can't stress how important that is. I mean, the infrastructure is already here in the U.S. A lot of facilities are already here, but just providing more investment and more incentives to make those investments in the U.S. is incredibly helpful, and it helps preserve the manufacturing jobs that we already have. I mean, motor vehicle suppliers are the largest sector of manufacturing jobs in the U.S. We really like talking about that, and programs like 48C can help preserve those jobs and grow those jobs for an already um, you know, healthy manufacturing sector. And it helps keep the U.S. innovation here. Um, you know, we're, we really are leading the way in this um, innovation for emissions technology and electrification, and it helps keep that innovation here. I think yeah. most importantly, we, we really feel like it's important that the industry, and I think Senator Manchin um, touched on this quite a bit, is that it's just important that the industry and the government keep collaborating to make sure that these technologies stay here, or the innovation stays here, the jobs stay here, the infrastructure and supply chain stay here. So that's why it's really important for uh, motor vehicle suppliers and the auto industry in general to um, for the 48C tax credits. That's a fantastic point. Yeah, and, and that, I mean, that leads me, I guess, to a question for, for Roxanne. Um, Lori was talking about trying to keep jobs here in the US. Um, Josh gave some numbers about what, you know, previous rounds of 48C were projected to, to do and what some of the upcoming third way analysis shows. It's, it is really impressive in the amount of jobs that are created. Um, creating jobs in, in any sector is, is helpful. It's a good thing. Um, but what is special about jobs in manufacturing? Um, why should we be working especially hard on 48C and, and other types of policies that create these particular kinds of jobs? Ryan, uh, thank you. I really appreciate that question. And I, again, appreciate being on the panel with all of you today. I wanted to actually just quickly emphasize what Lori just said, because it was it's so too, yeah. important. Um, number one, a little known fact actually about the Steelworkers Union is we are actually the largest union in the auto supply chain, in the auto, auto supply check sector. People often think about the UAW as the auto union, but our members make all of the stuff that goes into vehicles. And so um, everything that you said, Lori, about making sure that we have a really strong domestic supply chain in the United States, um, making sure that those jobs remain, how important those uh, sectors and those jobs are to innovation in this economy, I can't emphasize more. So I appreciate you saying that. Um, also to that point, one of the companies that we watch that we really are just proud of the work that they do is Corning. You know, they're always um, doing a lot in the way of R, D, and D, um, looking at how they can retool and invest, um, making sure that they're innovating along the way. And they're actually one of the companies that received uh, 48C funds in the first round. They got, I think, about $30 million to do exactly what you were describing, Lori, and actually what James was describing earlier in terms of emission control technologies. And they invested in their New York facility where steelworker members work um, to make these uh, diesel emission control products. So I just wanna just highlight the automotive piece and just how important that is to, to the goal that we all have uh, of reducing emissions and growing this, these, this sector. Uh, in terms of manufacturing jobs, you know, it, they really are the pathway to the middle class. We often say internally in our union that manufacturing jobs across the suite of our sectors, whether it's steel or paper or rubber, these are really the kind of last best remaining jobs in, in the United States where someone can, you know, in Philadelphia, you know, can earn $90,000 uh, plus plus, meaning plus healthcare, uh, plus retirement benefits that allow them to not only have a really good um, standard of living today, 
but also to be able to retire with dignity, right, at the end of their career working these really hard jobs. Uh, so that's really what's unique about manufacturing jobs. And, um, you know, in, in terms of just the overall impact that it has, not just on a family, because we refer to these as family sustaining jobs, these are also community sustaining jobs because the tax base that's generated from uh, the income that our members in the sector earn go to our schools in our communities, our libraries, our roads, our bridges, our hospitals. And if nothing else, this pandemic has shown us how critical it is to have a really strong healthcare infrastructure in this country. And the wages that our members earn in the manufacturing sector lend to making sure that we have really good really strong hospitals in these communities. And it's not a connection that people often make when it comes to manufacturing jobs. And just kind of the added value in terms of the community as well, for every hundred manufacturing jobs, you know, uh, you get between anywhere between 500 and 700 indirect jobs. So it cannot be emphasized enough how manufacturing really is kind of the backbone of, of this economy. And, and I'll just say, you know, lastly, in terms of 48C, I think what's so important about that policy is that it directly embeds job creation because job, domestic job creation is quite literally one of the criteria in the policy. And when we talk about forward leaning policy and policies that are really going to grow this economy and grow the types of jobs that we need to see, uh, that's what we want. We wanna see pieces like that embedded in, in, in manufacturing policy. Yeah, that's a great point. And, you know, and, and, it, and it made me think, there was a paper that Third Way worked on um, actually with Jason Walsh um, a couple of years ago um, and showing that that for every one job made uh, created in the manufacturing sector, you get three and a half or three about three and a half FTEs in non-manufacturing sectors, which is I, I, it was at the at the time the highest job multiplier effect in the economy. So these are really these these do have a, a bit of a superpower when it comes to um, to the economic benefit. Again, you know, creating uh, jobs in all types of sectors is really important. But this is one to, that we need to keep our eye on uh, and make sure we're taken care of. Um, so yeah, thank you for bringing that up. And uh, my colleague Jackie is is dropping a, that paper I just mentioned into the chat in case anyone is interested. Um, so I guess um, you know if anybody else on the panel has anything they want to follow that up with, I have a few more specific questions. But feel free to jump in. Going once, going. Well, back. I'd like to just uh, thanks, Ryan. I just would like to say I love the framing that Roxanne just used about embedding certain values and certain outcomes into policy. I feel the exact same way about how this embeds carbon emissions reductions into our manufacturing and industrial policy. And I think that is a the kind of win win that is going to be especially critical as we try to tackle these multiple generational problems at the same time. Absolutely. Well, and Derek, you know, while, while you're up, I, I wanted to ask, you know, how do you see domestic clean energy manufacturing? Because that's what we're talking about here. We're, you know, we are trying to really reward companies for making decisions about manufacturing here in the US. How does that domestic clean energy manufacturing fit into the larger goals of decarbonizing nationwide, but also globally? A lot of the sectors where these credits are going to be used are really tough to decarbonize. And I think it's critical that we focus on the fact that this policy is um, going to bring broad change and create broad incentives. I think you heard both Lori and Roxanne talking about um, the variety of different ways that this can be useful. I also think that from the standpoint of building pride and unity within our country about tackling the climate crisis, creating jobs and making things that are part of our future economy is just a great way to do that. And so I see that, I see those two features of this kind of program as being especially vital. And as markets, we know that markets for clean energy are increasing. It is, you know, at a very minimum, reducing the amount of goods movement emissions is critical. We don't know what the manufacturing 
and environmental and labor standards are in some of the other places where we would otherwise be importing components from. And so there's a whole lot of reasons to bring these supply chains onshore in addition to supporting the work of leaders like Senator Manchin who are trying to create bipartisan unity around issues at a time where there are so few options for doing that. Yeah, that's that's helpful to to understand and that you know there there are export opportunities that could come from uh, the facilities and the product lines that are uh, that are started by this. We definitely want to help jumpstart um, the manufacturing, but also deployment domestically. That these could create some opportunities um, for competitiveness, as JT was talking about, highly competitive markets in some of these industries. So our domestic manufacturing base would actually be able to help us probably in some cases um, uh, become more competitive uh, in these growing industries worldwide. You know, one other question that I had, um, and we'll turn to Q&A from the audience soon, was 48C, as we talked about, it was a, it, it was a pre-existing program um, that was implemented in its course. Um, but does this give it any, uh, any advantage or give a revived 48C credit any advantage over some other program that's that needs to be created out of whole cloth and if so what what kind of advantage do you think that might have you know going I think some people might say well let's look for new solutions let's you know what is some what are some of the benefits of taking something that we've done before and modernizing it well we need to do both because um, even at eight billion dollars which the senator said is the current number in the in his bill with Senator Stabenow that is just a, a small component of what we need to do broadly to decarbonize our economy in a way that creates high paying union jobs. So, and secondly, in the first round, it was oversubscribed by three to one. You know, there were two thirds of the, of the projects that tried to get tax credit funding didn't get them. So this is a natural continuation and expansion along with the importance of supporting other ways to galvanize a low carbon economy in this country. And I would just add to that, I, I totally agree with what Derek says that we, you know, we can walk and chew gum at the same time without question, we can do both. Um, and it was completely oversubscribed as we all know. But also when you look at just how diffuse it was in terms of the projects, the 183 projects, right? Across 43 states. <laughs> so that tells you that it was a need and a desire on the part of these companies that requested um, th these funds to do something different. And they've been starved for these, for these funds to try to upgrade and invest in their facilities. One of the things that, um, you know, in terms of a, a union that represents energy intensive industries, they're, they're looking across the board at pots of money where they can invest they want to exist in this country for the long term. They don't want to phase out. They want to play a role in the clean energy economy. And 48C is a mechanism for helping them to do that. And the fact that we were able to kind of look across who was awarded um, these funds from, you know, from Rotec to Corning to PPG Industries, all steelworker represented companies, uh, it, it tells us something as the steelworkers as well, how important it is for us to be here at the table uh, lending our voice to this and how important and critical this is for domestic manufacturing. Yeah, well, that actually gets to, uh, I don't know, JT, did you have anything you wanted to add there? Sorry. Well, I, I just wanted to follow up on your, you know, your initial question of how important is it to have an existing program on the books? And I think, you know, if, if anything, we have seen uh, that getting consensus in Washington is so, so difficult. So having a program that already has achieved consensus once, even if it needs to be changed, and I think uh, exactly what Roxanne and Derek were saying, yes, of course, 48C needs to be changed. I mean, it was made in 2009, and we're going into 2021 very shortly. And in the world of technology, you know, 12 years is a lifetime, uh, maybe several lifetimes. Um, in our industry, in 2009, we were thinking of hybrid electric vehicles. That was that was cutting edge. Now everybody's looking at battery electric vehicles. I mean, we have we have jumped from hybrid electric to plug-in electric to now battery electric vehicles. 
So certainly 48C needs to be changed. It can be updated. And I think what Senator Manchin and Senator Stabenauer is doing in that regard is absolutely the way to go. But the fact that it achieved consensus once mm -hmm. is so such a strong argument for saying, let's go back and rework this program um, and and build on the success we've already had. Yeah, I mean, that, that actually gets to uh, something that's an, an audience question that came in about, you know, how will you get, we had a couple of related questions. How do you, how do you get these projects distributed fairly, geographically, um, which, you know, Roxanne brought up. We, had, we kind of saw that happen uh, in the first rounds of 48C. Um, uh, it's a competitive grant and you can, you can steer things to, to have a broader distribution, but how can we make sure that's done fairly, but also, can that be done in a way that brings in more political support, bipartisan support? Um, you know, do we think that targeting certain areas and, and industries could actually make this something that gets the support it might need from Senator Manchin's Republican colleagues to actually get over the finish line? Do we think that's a possibility? I, absolutely, uh, I, I, I absolutely do. I have been, uh, able to see some of the things that Senator Manchin and Senator Stabenow are talking about. And Roxanne mentioned this as well. Uh, job creation is one of the criteria. So as we're working on 48C, we can, these are, are uh, all of these credits, they're not automatic. It's not like say the R&E credit, which just accrues to you if you do the qualifying research. These are awarded. So we can make a criteria that rewards um, helping different industries, looking in different ways. Um, job creation uh, was in there, can be in there again. Um, innovation, um, we have the ability and, and certainly uh, Congress ultimately does to write just the kind of criteria they want. But I think your question, Ryan, is, is absolutely important. Yeah, we, we need to make sure that it's going to spread out to build the broad kind of political support that we're gonna to need to get this over the finish line again. And I can just speak to that base, you know, basic terms is that I think a lot of folks feel like the motor vehicle um, industry is just in Michigan and Ohio and Indiana. And that's absolutely not true. I mean, motor vehicle suppliers have jobs in all 50 states and actually our fastest growing area is in the Southeast. So those jobs are really spread out. Um, contrary to popular belief. So I know Roxanne could probably speak to that as well about how spread out the jobs are. I think you nailed it, Lori. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so uh, if folks in the audience have any uh, additional questions, there are one or two more to get to, um, but feel free to drop those in. We've got a few minutes left. Um, uh, one, one additional question here. Um, if you are starting a new manufacturing line or retooling uh, to change what it produces, what level of workforce training or retraining would be needed? Um, you know, so what will the workforce needs be to accommodate a 48C? And this is something that you know, came up a little bit earlier in the, in the conversation. Um, do any of you have thoughts on that? So, you know, I think this is a big question, right? It's a, it's a very big question. And it's a question that's always at the forefront of the minds of, of, of labor unions. Um, especially as the nature of the work is changing and as, as companies are, especially in the supply chain, are shifting to kind of um, produce the types of products that OEMs need, right? We know that, that, that the workforce needs kind of additional training. Um, some of that training, our union is different. We're not a building trades union, right? And the building trade system, that's, that's the IBW, that's, you know, um, uh, the, the plumbers and pipe fitters, they do these training programs in-house and actually are doing a lot of this work right now. Um, we're a bit different where, you know, our members work for these, these companies um, that in, in many cases do the training, you know, kind of on the job or they partner with local colleges or community colleges and such to, to provide this training. So, so from our perspective, that's a really, really key element for steel worker members. We need to make sure that um, this kind of on the job training is provided by the employer, 
but also that those employers are doing their due diligence and partnering where it makes sense um, to train the workforce for the types of work that, that they're, they're gonna need to do as, as facilities are upgrading their lines and retooling and, and such. And I think uh, building on what Roxanne just said, uh, that I think it, it's frequently underestimated just how dynamic these manufacturing jobs are. Um, I know can speak from uh, in our company, we're constantly changing model types. Uh, we're constantly changing what is being built here in a particular plant or in a, uh, or even if it's just a different model, but it could be uh, a, com a completely different vehicle type. Um, so retraining it, uh, is actually constantly ongoing with these workforces. They're used to it. Um, and I think as Senator Manchin um, pointed out in regards to the coal miners, um, these people are, are hungry for these kind of training skills as well. I mean, everybody knows this is where the future is. This is where they want to be. And I think Roxanne spoke very eloquently to it. Um, these are the kind of jobs that they want to make sure their children are getting as well. Mm -hmm. It's not just for them, but you know, we have worker after worker in Ford that can proudly point and say, my grandfather worked in this very factory, you know, and we want to keep it that way. They want to keep it that way. So training and retraining is a constantly ongoing process. And we have a very motivated workforce that wants that training. Absolutely. That's, that's great. So I, this will be the last question. And I think it's a good one to end on. Uh, we had somebody in the audience ask um, how a concerned citizen or an organization can help support this legislation and when will it be introduced? Um, I know that Senator Stabenow and Senator Manchin are, have been trying to get this introduced this year. Um, whether or not they're able to do that, it's definitely going to need to be reintroduced next year. So that's going to be happening pretty soon. Um, you can keep track of that. You're welcome to go to our website, thirdway.org, and you can sign up for our email um, uh, updates. And we'll be letting folks know when that is introduced. But I think at that point, the number one thing you can do is reach out to your uh, members of Congress and let them know that you support it and why. Um, uh, we're lo really looking forward to seeing this bill um, when it's introduced and seeing it inserted into a discussion that's going to be really broad ranging and I think could be very effective next year on the larger suite of infrastructure and economy boosting stimulus activities that can both you know, help boost the economy while also leading us toward a clean energy future. So I think 48C has a great place in that discussion inserting my own opinion into the panel here. But um, so with that, I think we're gonna wrap up, um, but thank you everybody in the audience for joining us. And I also wanna thank our panelists for their time and their perspectives. I've learned a lot here, so thank you. Um, thanks to our co-hosts, the good people at BGA and EDF. Um, and a huge thanks to Jackie to Toth, who uh, is the advisor for policy and content at Third Way uh, in our climate and energy program to put all this together. Um, and she'll be reaching out to everyone uh, at the end of the week with her latest analysis on previous 48C projects uh, and a link to the recording of today's event in case you thought it was so good that you want to uh, get your family together and rewatch it over the holidays. Uh, so again, thank you everybody. Really appreciate you being here and uh, enjoy the rest of your week. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Happy thank holidays you. to everybody. Thanks so much. Yeah, happy holidays. Bye-bye.